Every one of us, every person has talent somewhere. And it's just like light. The more concentrated and the more pressure, the more focused you make that talent, the more impact or power it actually has. And that level of discipline and focus that I was taught during basic training has helped me stay the course on things like business. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on, good, bad, or indifferent, you've got a mission to achieve. You know, you have to accomplish that mission. And I think that level of discipline and focus is, is very applicable in business because in business, things rarely go as planned, but you have a mission that you have to accomplish and you have to be able to get there no matter what. So anytime that you're not willing to step out and be your true authentic self, you're just, you're, you're just dimming the flame. You're shrinking and no greatness has ever come from that. You have to basically be your best authentic self, put yourself out there and shine because what you're doing in that process is you're giving other people the permission to shine and you will rise up people around you and have a greater influence over, over your audience and impact on this world than you could ever imagine. I understand that failure is is actually a necessary part of success. You know, it, it just truly is. It's just like exercise. If you want to grow your performance from exercise, you actually have to get the muscle to failure. And if you don't get the muscle to failure, the muscle doesn't grow. I think in life and business, we're just like that. You sometimes have to figure out and try things and be willing to fail and then just correct the mistake. Just say, hey, this is a mistake. This is not the right way. Don't beat yourself up over it. And just say, okay, this is not right. Let's do something different and just move on and treat it as not right or wrong, but is or isn't. Yeah, I make mistakes, but the reality is, is I'm not gonna be defined by the mistakes that I make. I'm gonna define myself by the results of how I overcome those mistakes and where I end up from them. Welcome back to another episode of American Real, where this week we feature speaker, entrepreneur, and angel investor, Dan Mori. Dan was the first director at the Kaufman Southern Tier Incubator, where we record our show. The organization's mission is to support up-and-coming businesses and foster economic growth. This young entrepreneur has a successful track record for identifying businesses that fill a void in the marketplace. In addition, Dan discusses how his time in the Army was a key factor in teaching him how to be adaptable in both business and in life. So please sit back and relax as I welcome Dan Mori. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Dan Mori entrepreneur, speaker, angel investor. Dan, welcome to the show. Roger, thank you for having me. <laughs> this has been a long time in the making. I've been wanting to come on the show and have this conversation with you, so I appreciate you, uh, appreciate you making it happen. No, and sometimes uh, it just, this came together very quickly uh, the same day. It did. And you know what? I love it because sometimes that's when we have the best conversations, when we, we don't have to think too much. I agree with that. I agree with that. And obviously I've been following you for a couple of years now because where we shoot this show here in the Kaufman Southern Tier Incubator is where you opened this place up as the director. I, I love it. I, I love that you're here doing it, I, but I love this place. I mean, when, when the university came to me and they said, this is our vision for Binghamton and the Southern Tier and how we can take 
our intellectual property and our resources and really catalyze the community with startups, I was on board day one, 100%. And I was proud to be part of that and help them get going. And for people that don't know what a business incubator is, because I, I, you know, I had my sister come in town and showed her the building, she had no idea. Um, and, and I find that many people don't know. Can you it's give a, a, a bit of a brief or a bit of a background sure. on what, what it does for a community? So simply put, a business incubator is a place where somebody that has an idea or a desire to start a company, be an entrepreneur or a founder, and really create a product or service to bring to market, it's where they can go and take that idea and work with mentors, be part of a program, be connected to access to capital and things like that. And every possible business resource that you would even need to grow a business and be mentored along the way to help you scale your business and ultimately graduate out to a thriving business in the community. So what would some of those resources be as an example? So the number one resource that I tell people that if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to launch, you're looking to start something, connect with somebody that's done it before. And I'll tell you, and you know this, you, you've, you've ran things, especially like this, like you've made a million mistakes. I've made a million mistakes. Yeah. It's like, go find that person that's made all of those mistakes, that's willing to mentor you and be your Sherpa and guide you to the top of the mountain. And that's one of the best resources you can get out of the Kaufman here is we have entrepreneurs and residents and mentors that they've been in all different types of businesses. They have huge Rolodexes. Do the kids still say Rolodexes? <laughs> I, I said it before and people said, what's that? What is it? It's a contact <laughs> list. They have huge contact lists, right? And, uh, and that's it. And they, they really, they care more about helping perpetuate or propel that entrepreneur to, to greatness than they do out of their own accolades. So that's probably the number one resource that you can get. One of the cool things that we have here is we have an accelerator program that's funding back or investment back. So the companies that perform the strongest, they have a chance to actually earn investment or receive really? investment for, for equity and help them on their way. Um, and we also have an investment fund that will invest in promising startups. So this is a, I'm obviously biased, but this is one of the strongest incubators that you're gonna find in the country as far as connecting resources to, to startups. When, when the building first opened, was it difficult to get startups in not at all not at all we i gotta i gotta say that binghamton university and the the foundation and all the partners that came together to make it happen we had a pretty good vision we recognized that when you introduce something new like this to a community that has never had something like this before you can't be super selective you have to meet the community where they're at so we basically opened the doors and said, come as you are, bring your ideas to us, let us help you foster those ideas and grow them. And as it turns out, as you know from the history of Binghamton, this is a very entrepreneurial city. You know, this community is full of entrepreneurs, a lot of great stories, companies that started here. I mean, Dick Sporting Goods started here. You know, Link was the first VR company ever. Yeah. You know, so we've got some amazing companies. IBM was founded here. So this, is, this was a startup community before startup communities were cool. So it wasn't hard to find industrious founder type people that had ideas that wanted to grow. So we, we got to 75%, 85% occupancy within the first couple of months. It, oh, was pretty, it was pretty special. And any success stories so far when you started? Are, are there people that are out now on their own? Yeah, they've graduated, I believe it's nine or 10 now. I've, uh, I've actually handed the reins over about a year ago, but I believe there's nine or 10 companies that have graduated out. Uh, some as cool as KBL that does great social media marketing and branding and, and Adam does a fantastic job to companies that they haven't graduated yet, but Bandelier. I mean, they've grown and they're, they're up to 60 employees just in a two year period is massive scale, but they are one of the best inside sales organizations that you'll ever find. And I mean, and that's huge scale in that time. And then we have other companies like Charge C4V and Imperium 3 that are doing amazing things in the, the clean energy space. and. I mean, the list goes on and on. We've had a lot of successes in a very short period of time. That's awesome. So let's talk about you and your backstory a little bit. How did you become an entrepreneur? When did it start? Oof. Oh, when did it start? It, so I would say the hustle started when I was a kid. I, I was always doing something to, to make money, whether, whether it be you know, buying bubble gum and selling it for more money to my friends or you know, swapping and bartering with toys or trading cards. So I, th I think that I was kind of born with it, but the, the real first foray, believe it or not, is when I was 17. It was the summer I was waiting to leave for boot camp for the army and I started a masonry business. I, I was working, uh, laying block and stone with a guy and I said, hey, you know what? We should actually create a business out of this and grow this thing. And 
that was it. I'll tell you that when I got out of the military, I realized that I didn't want to abuse my body like that for 40 years. So uh, I, I landed in a job that I didn't like, and then an opportunity presented itself to get into staffing and employment with a couple of buddies. And we said, hey, why don't we make a go at recruiting? And we started a small little bootstrap company in Elmira, New York. And that was 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And today we've got you know a dozen offices throughout the country. We operate in 28 states, and it's been a pretty special ride. Wow. What's the name of that business? So that's Employment Solutions. Okay. And is that one of the businesses that you actually built and sold? Or do you still... So, no, I, I still uh, reside on the board. I still work a little bit in operations with the strate uh, strategy side of the strategic planning. I also handle some of the business development. But I do have two fantastic partners that really run the operations from the front of the house with recruiting and fulfillment and then the back of the house with the, the financial and insurance side. Okay, so, so let's talk about this. Why would someone like you want to depart from a business like that? That's a great question. I think the, the reality is, is it's an amazing company, but it's established, it's mature, it's a fairly well-oiled machine, it's still growing, it's still hitting its marks. And I, for some weird sadistic reason, I love startup life. Like I liked the journey to get there. so. You know, when I was presented with an opportunity by the university to be a part of the incubator and help other startups and give back, that was important to me. You know, I also wanted the opportunity to, to give back to other founders like myself. I mean, I, I don't come from affluent background. You know, I don't come from, you know, a well-educated background. I came from a family that was working class and we had to fight for everything that we got. And I know how hard that journey was and I know how meaningful it was for me when we achieved some level of success with employment solutions. And if I could help somebody else that has that dream or that desire achieve that for themselves and carve out their own path and help them maybe avoid some of the many mistakes that I made and help expedite their, their trajectory, like that, that is fulfilling work. And I, I think that that type of calling is what really allowed me to take a hiatus from Employment Solutions to help out with the, the incubator and get that going and to see the impact that it's having right here in Binghamton. That's incredible. So I'd like to back up just a little sure. bit. So you, you have this in your blood, you're selling trading cards and bubble gum and as a kid, now you decide to go into the army. We have a lot of people that follow the show that are in the armed forces. And I love engaging with them yeah. because they're tough people. I mean, I, I have so much respect for our military. And I'd just like to know if, if though, was it four years that you spent? So I, I joined as a reservist. And then when things got a little bit dicey in the Middle East the second time, I spent a couple years on active duty. Okay. So how did that experience prepare you mentally for the work that you do today and, and previous. Did that have an impact on, on, on your life? 100%. So growing up, I was uh, high energy, scatterbrained, full of potential, big dreamer, wanted to do it all at once. And when I joined the military and went to basic training specifically and had some of the best drill instructors that, that you can probably ask for, even though in the moment I didn't feel that way about them, but looking back, I'm grateful for them. They really were able to, to take all of that kind of raw talent that I did have and focus it and teach me how to be disciplined enough to apply it to something. And, and I think that's really the, the biggest lesson that I got out of it is every one of us, every person has talent somewhere. And it's just like light. The more concentrated and the more pressure, the more focused you make that talent, the more impact or power it actually has. And that level of discipline and focus that I was taught during basic training has helped me stay the course on things like business. Because in the military, and I, I big, big shout out to all the service members that follow the show. You know, I'm grateful for, for their sacrifice and their service. But they know first and foremost that things rarely go as planned. You know, and they know that you have to be creative and you have to be disciplined enough to adjust on the fly, but stay focused on the mission. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on, good, bad, or indifferent. You've got a mission to achieve. You know, you have to accomplish that mission. And I think that level of discipline and focus is, is very applicable in business because in business, things rarely go as planned, but you have a mission that you have to accomplish and you have to be able to get there no matter what. So 
it's helped out significantly. Yeah, I could see that connection very much. What do you say to entrepreneurs when you first meet with them? What are you looking for in a, in a startup? What are you looking for as far as the characteristics in the person or people that are running a new organization? Number one quality or trait, and I'll actually, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll break it into two, but the number one quality or trait that I look for is grit, hands down. Uh, this is not, I, I always tell people that entrepreneurship, you know, is, is for anybody, but it's not for everybody. You know, and that's what I love about it, is it's not, you can come from any background, any origin, race, it doesn't matter. You can be an entrepreneur, but it is not for everybody. So you have to be gritty. You have to have passion and perseverance that kind of make up that grit that will push you through the really, really difficult times. And I guarantee you this, if you're starting something, there will be really, really difficult times. And you have to have that mental makeup that just says, I don't care how I feel right now. I'm gonna sacrifice today for a better tomorrow. I'm willing to surrender the results and do the work anyway because I know that this is worth it in the end. And I just, I wanna know that I'm looking at someone or working with someone that has that level of commitment to self and commitment to perseverance to, to stay the course. Now, uh, I, I read a lot about entrepreneurs and hear people speak and, and one of the things I continue to hear is that the people that fail tend to be too much in love with their idea. Does that make sense? Um, meaning they don't know when to pivot if they need to. So in one sense that makes sense. I mean the number one reason that businesses fail is because people build things that no one cares about, right? So that's where I could see that bias coming in. You'd be like, why don't you care about it? And then you just keep looking for that one person that cares about it. And the reality is one person doesn't make a market. You know, so I can see that, that playing into it, not knowing when to uh, pivot. But I think that has more to do with self-awareness than it does being too in love with their product. I think if you're gonna be an entrepreneur and you're gonna have success at it, I think you have to be self-aware enough to know what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, what's going well, what's not going well, and then be objective to feedback. Like, you can't take it personal, you know? We had a, a customer of one of my companies the other day say, hey, I don't mean to sound negative or I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but there's this thing and we're like, no, tell us. Like, just tell us as it is. Like, give us the feedback. Like, we don't, we don't get offended. You know, we just take it, we look at it and we say, hey, can this make us better and can it help us better serve our audience? And so I think it has more to do with self-awareness as to why someone might not know when the right time to pivot is versus too much love for their, their product. And being objective, right? You know, yeah, you have to. I, I, it's a blend. I, I honestly, you can't be completely objective in business because then you lose all the passion, you know, the personality side of it. But I think you have to know when to be subjective and, and objective to, to what's going on. But you, you definitely need to be objective to feedback, but subjective to your plan forward. Okay, so let's take it a step further. Now, uh, someone has a great idea. You know, you're in there, you're looking at the business, you like it, but they don't quite have the business model figured out. Is that where you help out? Sure. Yeah, no, we'll, uh, you know, I, I will sit down and I'll work with them. And first off, I, I'll want to know why did they come up with the business model that they did? Because I could be wrong. You know, I don't, I don't profess to know everything. So I, I really got to understand, hey, I understand your business, but why did you come up with this? And they might say, this is why I did it. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense now. But if they don't quite have it figured out or they're missing one of their components and they might not know how to get or keep or grow customers or they might not fully understand the vendor side or what, what, what the right revenue model is, I'll certainly help them out with that, you know. But my level of helping is not telling them what to do. I tend to try to give people some options and education around it and then try to pull the decision out of them so they own it. Because people are more likely to own a decision that they make and they're more likely to, they're more easily gonna quit on a decision that maybe they were told to do. So uh, that's typically how I would try to engage with them there. That's great. So, okay, now let's move to where you are today. Uh, you left the incubator. I did and you moved down to uh, Florida, I believe, or yes, wherever. Part time, wherever. South Florida, we split time. We're, uh, we're the early snowbird, I guess. Okay, and can you tell us about what's happening in your life today? Yeah, so I'll tell you, it was, it was a difficult decision to leave the incubator. This is a special, special place. I love the team that works here. I love the mission they're having. However, there was two major things that were happening at the same time that just let me know that it was time. And the team let me know that it was okay because they're very good at what they do. But 
first and foremost, I have another startup. You know, like I told you, I love that journey. I like being on it. I feel like I've got this, uh, this great idea to help hospitality companies automate their staffing and recruiting in a very cost-effective way, so I launched SpinGig. And I was actually able to take a, a Binghamton University graduate that joined me, uh, and he has been fantastic in helping grow it. He's young, he's more uh, in tune with the demographic and some of the modern tools and resources we have. I'm a little bit older and more experienced, so we take that kind of wisdom and experience and we mirror it with his innovative mindset and we're really creating something special. So we were growing that and as a startup grows, it starts to consume more and more resources, more time. So I had to focus my effort and be disciplined and say, this is what I'm gonna focus my attention on. So I started spending more time growing that, which is going gangbusters right now. We're excited, we are you know, in revenue, which is another major milestone for, for startups to actually get to the revenue piece and starting to grow our monthly recurring revenue and customer base and expand markets, so that's fun. Uh, but my company, Employment Solutions, we also acquired a company in South Florida as well. And we acquired that company in a market that we knew SpinGig was going to be launching into. So it just, it's almost like the universe just lined up and said, Dan, why don't you relocate the family to South Florida in the winter, which isn't a terrible time to be there. And we're able to, to acclimate that business and that team is, is fantastic and they've grown tremendously. And we've launched Spin Gig in the Fort Lauderdale market and my family absolutely loves the uh, Florida winners. So wow. it worked out all the way around. That's great. So Dan, talk about those internal signs that we all have and we hear these voices, you know, and sometimes we don't know if we should listen to them or not, you know, and it sounds like this was one of those times where you, you really listen to your internal voice. Yeah. So here's, here's something that I think is, is differentiates me from, from most people. And this, maybe the military played into this, maybe some of my mentors have played into this, but I, I'm okay making mistakes. I don't mind failure. I understand that failure is, is actually a necessary part of success. You know, it, it just truly is. It's just like exercise. If you want to grow your performance from exercise, you actually have to get the muscle to failure. And if you don't get the muscle to failure, the muscle doesn't grow. I think in life and business, we're just like that. You sometimes have to figure out and try things and be willing to fail and then just correct the mistake. Just say, hey, this is a mistake. This is not the right way. Don't beat yourself up over it and just say, okay, this is not right. Let's do something different and just move on and treat it as not right or wrong, but is or isn't. And um, I, I've made a, a bunch of mistakes with, with, honestly, we overbuilt Spin Gig to start out. We, we did something that I teach most startups not to do. And we built a very elaborate, trying to make it perfect product before we even launched it to our customers. And when we got it to market, our customers told us, don't eat all of it. Don't eat that. That doesn't work the way that our business works. We could change that. And I was like, okay, all right. I, uh, I know all this, but I did it anyway. So yeah, I make mistakes. But the reality is, is I'm not going to be defined by the mistakes that I make. I'm going to define myself by the results of how I overcome those mistakes and where I end up from them. And that's why today we've, we've turned Spinging into a more dynamic, nimble platform that can more readily react and, and be revised based on our customers' needs. So that's one example. I'm, I'm so glad you talked about that because I think there's a lot of people, myself included, that you know we're, we, we want to be perfectionists. We're afraid to put out content or something and, and until it's perfect. And we spend so much time, whereas, like you said, if, if, you, if you get it out there, you could learn, you know, from from what's there and the feedback that you receive yeah. uh, to do it better next time. But there is something to getting it out there, isn't there? Absolutely, absolutely. Don't just don't be afraid to fail. Don't let don't be so afraid of what other people are going to think about you that you let those perceived expectations of other people build a cage around yourself. Like just don't do it. Like, just be authentic. Just be yourself, put it out there. And the mo this is the most amazing thing. I think, I think the world is so big that most people can't conceptualize it. I think that we think that when we're going on camera like this here, or we're gonna go on a podcast or speak in front of a bunch of people, I think that we think that we're so different that we're gonna be perceived negatively so that we have to put on some sort of front and we're afraid that like our authentic selves will never f create an audience. But the reality is, is the world is so big and the population of that globe is so diverse that I don't care how authentic or how niche your, your characteristics are, there's gonna be people that appreciate you and look to you as their champion. 
And I'll tell you that any time that you're not willing to step out and be your true authentic self, you're just, you're, you're just dimming the flame. You're shrinking and no greatness has ever come from that. You have to basically be your best authentic self, put yourself out there and shine because what you're doing in that process is you're giving other people the permission to shine and you will rise up people around you and have a greater influence over, over your audience and impact on this world than you could ever imagine. So yeah, don't, don't be afraid. All that stuff is in your own head. Just, just yeah, just let the head trash go and, and just step out. And, and honestly, once you break through that first zone and it becomes familiar, your comfort zone will expand and you'll get more comfortable doing it. Your influence will grow, your impact will grow, and you'll start to realize that you, 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 what you were meant for was a lot bigger than you originally thought. Well, what you just said there, Honest, is, is gold because that was a lesson that I had to learn. You know, I'll be 50 years old this year and we're conditioned to do things a certain way. We're conditioned not to go outside of our box and really not to be our authentic self. Yeah. And that was the biggest lesson I learned is when you, be, when you could be yourself, when you could be vulnerable, when you could just let it go, is when I've seen the most engagement. So yeah. I'm really, really glad that you said that. That's going to make a great clip that yeah. we're going to play over and over again. It, I, and, I, and I hope it resonates with people. Yeah. I really do. Because there is greatness within everybody. And they know it. And they just got to put it out there. And... You know, not just be authentic, you know, and get, get comfortable doing uncomfortable things and be okay with it. And trust me, once that comfort zone grows, life is so much more fulfilling and liberating. You know, I, I used to operate under those facades and those ideas of what, when I first got into business, I didn't know, like I didn't go to business school and I just, I had this image of what a CEO was based on Hollywood. And, you know, I would put on this this front like I was this CEO and I would act like you would see these CEOs on TV and it was just like so inauthentic and I was not connecting with people and you know people can smell fakes a mile away and I just I gave it up I'm like you know what I am who I am you know and I'm gonna upset some people and I'm okay with that but there's gonna be some people out there that are grateful that I was willing to step out and be my true self and give raw advice and for those people it's gonna make an impact and that is the reason you should do it, not because the haters hate. Love it. Dan, let's talk about abundance and let's talk about money and the importance of it as far as, look, the reality is, I believe, when we have money, when we get to a certain level, it helps us relieve ourselves as far as not being so uptight, right? We could, we could do more with the resources of it. Mm -hmm. But I also think there has to be a, a, a tremendous respect for it. Um, and there's a fine line. As you, you, you told me earlier, you didn't grow up affluent. So as you went up in your career and accumulated more wealth, did you see a difference in yourself? And maybe it took a little bit of time because you just mentioned that other story about you know, putting on this role. But at, at a certain point, does the money help you get to where you need to go from a mindset standpoint? Do you feel more comfortable? Do you feel like you could do more? Or, because I'm thinking about the people that are trying to get there and they're saying, oh, only if I had all this so, money, I could, you know what I mean? So you, could, you live both sides of it. So I'll, I'll say this. I, I think that those two things coincided. I, I think that I was starting to be more comfortable with my authentic self when my level of income and wealth was increasing. So I, I think it was there. I don't know that one directly influenced the other. I, I think that it was just a, the timing of maturation for me yeah. and some of my, my mentors pouring into me. But I think respect for money, money should never be the end goal. It, it just shouldn't. You know, money, and I teach my kids this, money is a tool. That's it. If, if you are going to really properly respect money and use money so money doesn't consume you and run you in your life, you need to have a vision for what you want your life to be, your authentic life, whether that be, you know, the, the beautiful house on Maui or, you know, maybe the house in the mountains or maybe something humble, you know, somewhere. Whatever that is for you, you need to figure out what that perfect life looks like. And, and how you want your life to be, and then figure out what level of money needs to be the tool to help you get there. You know, and be, be respectful in the management of it. I, I will tell you, some of the best financial management or advice or knowledge I've ever received is from my financial advisor, Paul Sidlansky. This guy, 
I've been prospected by every type of financial advisor you can imagine. With my LinkedIn profile, I get hit all the time. And a lot of them, especially like the big box brand financial advisors, nothing against them. I mean, they're all, I'm sure, uh, have, and they mean well, but they all had the same prescribed sort of financial guidance. And for me being an entrepreneur where my work and my life and my wealth are so all intertwined, it didn't fit their model, you know? So somebody like Paul actually sat down with me and said, Dan, let's build a system that actually treats your wealth the way that it is on paper and in liquidity and actually create a way to manage a budget that manages it so you don't have to ever see money or do whatever it just kind of goes, but then also feeds these other buckets of, you know, giving back and, you know, donating to charities and then also investing and saving and doing all those things. And, you know, we've been able to take it based on percentages of what we used to, you know, we started out with with really kind of 90, 10, 10. We're gonna live on 90, give 10, save 10. And then we started to get that living part down as, as income goes up and we get a little bit more modest in our lifestyle and things like that. But then we can add in the investment bucket. So now we can actually start doing some investments in the startups and you know, increasing what we're giving and tithing away. And I think just, just having a system to use money to get you where you wanna be in life, I think is the right way to approach it. And, and I would recommend you know, getting with somebody that's smart about money, smarter about money than you are, yes. you know, and I don't know, I don't, I didn't come from a, like I said, a financially affluent family that taught me much about money. So it took time in my later life, meeting somebody like Paul Sedlansky to say, hey, Dan, this is what you need to be doing. And this is how money works. And honestly, he was monumental with getting me just to take some money out of a cash account that was earning maybe a quarter of a percent and just moving into a high yield account. And like that was literally one simple transaction that's better for me. And it's a common sense thing, but I just wasn't taking action right. there. Right. So I needed somebody like him to say, hey, this is how you do it. And, um, but it is a tool. But, I, but I, last thing I wanna say to answer your question or address it is, yeah, there's an adage that says it takes money to make money, and it does, but not always. You can hustle. There's so many ways to, to hustle today to create a little bit of a side income or a revenue don't squander it. I've always been a good student to say, hey, I'm going to take most of what I earn and then reinvest it and then keep it more like a flywheel. You know, keep basically capitalizing on that energy to grow the influence of the wheel and then grow wealth. And then eventually I will have that perfect life or that vision life that I'm setting out to do. And then that's when I'll know to kind of cash out or do what I need to do financially. I'm so, so glad you said that. I just recently read a book called Transurfing. And that was one of the messages in the book is not to squander it's important to keep it flowing. It is. And, and again, to respect it, to the fact where making little transactions like you did, that's, that's, that's a win. Yeah. You know, as small as it may be, it's a win. It's a win. Going in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. Transurfing? Transurfing. I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, it's a 78 day program. You, lead, you read one passage a day for 78 days and it's amazing. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna try that out, I like okay. it. Um, okay, so what's next? What's next for you? What, what are you working on? What's exciting? What, you know, what are the hot things in your life right now? So this is, this is fun. So I love business and startup is great and Spin Gig is, is a fantastic company that's growing. Employment Solutions is growing, but we all need hobbies, right? <laughs> and and I, I like playing golf occasionally. That's fun and whatnot. But one of my favorite hobbies is actually podcasting. And I love this. I love talking business. I love talking shop. I just, I get so fired up and fulfilled in just these sorts of conversation. And I have one of my very best friends in the entire world, Sharif Hassan, that we've known each other for ever, it seems like. And we have some of the most fulfilling conversations that I have with anybody. And it, I feel like we never finish any conversation ever. We have like 30,000 different topics and nothing ever gets concluded maybe, but I always come away energized and I feel like, you know, we just synergized really well with that. So finally, speaking of taking action, he said, why don't we record this? Like, why don't we literally just record our conversations and do a show? And I was like, I, want, I love the idea. I love it because I feel good about those conversations and I, I want it to be accountable to having more of those. And we decided to create a podcast that's launching on October 29th. And it's called the FAQ Show, The Fact Show, Frequently Asked Questions. So the whole concept of this show and what we wanted to do is we want to tackle the real nitty gritty, frequently asked questions about startups, about business, valuations, investing, that kind of stuff, the behind the scenes stuff that never seems to show up on the FAQs of websites, right? <laughs> like the, the question that you're always asking yourself in the back of your mind, like, 
how do they really do this? You know? Yes. And, and we, we also want a kind of a side focus or an additional focus to be questions that young professionals might also be asking themselves on their journey. Because he and I, we, we come from different backgrounds, but we both had to figure a lot of things out on our journey. And we had great mentors along the way that we asked questions of and they helped mentor us. But we recognize there's a lot of people out there that might not have the mentors that we have or they might not have the, the role models or guidance or things like that that we had on that professional journey. And we just want to share. And uh, we're going to invite those people to, to follow, engage with us, ask their questions of us, and we'll discuss it openly on the air. Occasionally, we're going to have guests and talk about things that are going on and saying, hey, you, know, you said you were trying out this, uh, this trans-surfing 78-week program. How did it work? What did you get out of it? And, like, and talk about those things and just kind of you know, do a review of what's out there and help sort through some of the things that young professionals and startups and business people might be trying to navigate. I love it. I haven't heard of anything like this. So what's great about it is it seems new. It seems unique. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a, a huge audience, uh, young and old, of people that are, are interested in these questions that everyone wants to ask. I hope so. I hope so. I really, for me, I, I want it to be the ripple effect. I, I just... Uh, I, my, my true goal is that there's going to be somebody listening to the show somewhere on a drive to a job that they hate and they're inspired to tap into that greatness that's within them that's going to cause them to, to, to maybe leave a job that they hate to pursue an opportunity that might be risky but going to take them where they need to be in life. And, uh, and then hopefully they can pay it forward in the future. And if we can create those kinds of ripples through that content, then it's just another fulfilling entity. But yeah, that's... I'm juiced. I, honestly, I get giddy. I get giddy about it when it's time to record. You know, we, we just throw all the gear on, and some are video episodes, some are just audio, but I, uh, it's amazing. I come across to, uh, every episode completely fulfilled and energized, and I hope, I hope others get the same thing out of it. That's great. And when will this launch? So we're going to launch it live on iTunes and other podcasting platforms on October 29th of 2019. Great. Well, we'll, we'll definitely post that as well awesome. and get as many of our listeners over to, to check it out. That'd be huge. So I will say this for the, obviously one of our big goals is to uh, become part of the new and noteworthy on iTunes within the first eight weeks. So when we launch, we're going to be running some, some cool giveaways, great prizes for anybody that will follow the show, rate, review, subscribe to the show and help us achieve that goal for us and then be part of our community in, in growing this and helping other people on their journey. So please, please, please promote it. Uh, if you're out there watching this, please, please, please uh, rate, review and subscribe to the show and help us on our journey. Uh, we'll definitely do everything we can. Now, you talked about mentors and mentorship. Yeah. Who are some of your mentors? There's a lot. There's a lot. I have uh, one, of, one of my oldest mentors that goes back a while is actually Pastor Paul Perino from uh, Victory Highway Wesleyan Church. He's just a great business mind, uh, just a strong man, and he's been a great influence in my life uh, to be able to kind of keep me centered. Um, one of the best mentors I've had when it comes to business and, and sales and leadership was a gentleman named Tony Van Denther. And he was previously a Sandler sales system franchise owner. Uh, and I, that's how I met him. Really took to him. We're a lot alike. And he just, I spent a lot of time. He would basically just teach me from kind of his failures and what he did and some of his victories and kind of help shape me into be a, a better leader, more authentic person and kind of break that out of me. Um, so those are, those are two people that have really shaped me in, in my life and on, that, and on this journey. How about mentors from afar? Books, podcasts, who are some of the, oh. the people you like the best? Man, that list goes on and on. I listen to so many different podcasts. Um, I love John Lee Dumas stuff. I like Tim Ferriss. You know, Joe Rogan's fun. Um, those are good podcasts. Uh, books. I read so many different books. I'm just an audible guy. I will download books and listen to it. Um, what is the, the author's name is escaping me for the types of books I've read a ton. Uh, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team, uh, The Five Traits of, uh, what is it, of a CEO or an Exceptional Leader? What's his name? I can't think of his name. That's okay. We'll, we'll find it. You should. Put that in the show notes. Absolutely. Man, it's killing me now. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> That's all I right. Could, I could pull it up on Audible and see it. Yeah, I honestly, I, I'll tell you though, the, the type of book that I like to listen to the most though is 
something that has some sort of practical application to it. You know, I like, and that's actually why I like the, 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 the five dysfunctions of a team in that kind of book, because it's parable style. So the, the first part of the book is typically like a story, so you can really envision what it's like, and you can see the, the, the nuances of the situation playing out, and then you can see how the practical application kind of helps resolve the situation. And then the second half of the book is, is very much like a technical handbook that's and cool. how to apply it. So um, yeah, but those are great books. How about your book? When are you going to write a book? When am I going to write a book? You know, it's on the list. It's on the list. I don't know when yet, though. Someday. Someday. So earlier we talked about our youth and what we could do to learn from our youth. Can you talk about that and, and how important it is in a workplace? Because I know this is something that you focus on yeah. when you go into a workplace because there seems to be, especially today, I see it in my workplace where there's, there's a disconnect. You have these, you know, the young millennials who are bright and smart, uh, but, you know, maybe they're not getting along with, with, with the older folks. And how does, how does that come together? I will, I will tell you right now that companies that do not figure out how to bring the generations together and capitalize the strength and better synergize or pair that knowledge base from both sides equally are going to fail and they won't be around in five years. Now, how to bring it together, you need to first demonstrate value and trust to both sides and both sides need to recognize that they have something to offer. And the thing is, is that I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, but the younger generations, you, it is physically impossible for you to look further into the future than what you have relative experience. So the, the less experience you have, the shorter, the kind of the more short-sighted you're going to be and recognize that that's a blind spot in you and be okay with that. And just recognize that you have a lot of people that you're working with that have been doing it much longer than you that can fill in that blind spot. And if you go to them and you pick their brain and say, how do we do this? How do we, you know, and you, you know, how do we solve this? Or how do we figure this out? They can help you get better. And that minimal advantage to basically increase your, you know, how far you can see forward is huge. But on the flip side, we, you know, the older generation, the, the old guard, if you will, I have to look back and recognize that this young generation has grown up in a more modern, relevant society. Every one of their influences has come from the way that the world is today, not the way the world was 20 years ago. You know, so that has value. They see things the way that the world is today, and that right there can help break us out of the mindset of doing things the way that they've always been done. And if the old guard can recognize that they can pull lessons out of this youth for how to be more efficient, how to be more innovative, how to solve problems in a different way and think outside the box and they can come together like that. If you get a culture like that, that really pairs mentorship, mentorship up with the goal of moving that young person along because they're all hungry, they want to grow, they want to they attack the corporate ladder faster than anyone before them. And if you can pour into them, you will have a supercharged organization that just exceeds your goals. Are you um, bullish on this next generation coming up? How do you mean? Do you see promise? I do. I do. I see, I do see promise. The, the young generation that I typically engage with tend to be more on the entrepreneurial side. I think likeness attracts likeness. So I see people that have amazing ideas. I see people, and this is what I think is the most promise. I think, and there's a spectrum with everything, so not everyone's going to fall in this, but I'm going to over, over generalize here. But I think, generally speaking, this generation has a relentlessness to them and a, a desire to be heard more so than the prior two or three generations. And I think those two things coupled together are going to let their will be asserted on this country, on this world, and you're going to start to see that shift. Where I would give pause is going back to that how short-sighted you are is don't think that you have all the answers. You might have good answers, but they might not be all of the answers. So don't try to create the future that fully suits your needs and discards everything from generations before you because we all still have to live in this world together. So I think, I think that if the, the old guard generation could respect that youth and say, hey, what is the world you'd like us to help you create? And then leverage the resources, knowledge, and wisdom of that old guard to help create that world that we all want to live in. I think that that would be the best blend.
But I do see promise in this young generation. Great advice. Now, I know you were on um, the podcast Real Talk University. I love those guys. Two, two guys from Binghamton University. Um, what do you think about them? They, I think they exemplify the overgeneralization that, the overgeneralization that I just gave. I tell you, Andre and Christian are, have been... So let me tell you when I first met Andre. I was asked to sit in on a business pitch from a high school senior when I was running the incubator. And I'll be honest, Roger, I had a million things to do in my day. And the last thing I wanted to do was actually listen to a pitch from a high school student right. because, you know, it's like he's in high school, you know, how serious is this going to be? You know, and I, I want to get back, I want to help, but there's only so much of me to go around. So in my mind, I was just, I was a little bit reluctant. And I probably came off that way in the meeting, and I hope I didn't. But they sat in front of me, and they delivered one of the most smoothest pitches, one of the most well thought out and researched business ideas and plans that I had heard. And I had heard a ton of pitches in my time at that point. And I was just like, wow. And I love that because they took me out of that negative limiting belief yes. mindset that I was stuck in because I was just, I was caught up in the funk of the day and they broke me out of that and they basically said, okay, hey, listen to me. I have something of value and I saw that and I remember that they left the meeting and I told my team, I was like, watch them. I go, they might not hit it big on this one. They might not even hit it big on the next one. I don't know, but they, they will succeed. Watch them. And it wasn't long after that they presented a couple of other ideas to me and then they said, hey, we're doing this podcast. I said, I love podcasting, you know, and I, I, this is awesome. I'll help you out any way I can. And they launched their show and they, they literally have taken it to just, you know, stratospheric success and have done an amazing job with it. And what they, they don't realize is that because of what they've done on their show and me watching them and seeing the guests and how much fun they're having doing it, that's what inspired me to get back into it with the fact show. So wow. it really is, uh, yeah. It gives me the chills. It does. It's yeah. just amazing. And I, I want them to know that they're having influence upstream as well as downstream. Yeah. And yeah, Andre and Christian, they do, they do an amazing job. It's, an, it's a great show. And I recommend not even, I mean, definitely if you're in college, you, you got to listen to it because it will help shape you and form your future. But there's so many great nuggets and guests on that show that anyone can get value from. And I was just going to say, do, the guests that they're landing are incredible. <sighs> incredible it's like a dream list it is i'm just like how how do two young people from a relatively small community land the guests that they have yeah. and i'll tell you what it is it's because they don't define themselves as young people from a small community exactly they know exactly who they are they know exactly where they're going and they yep. know exactly what they deserve and they're going out to get it yeah. and that that's why they're successful and i saw that in the very first time that i met them and i was just like they're going to get it and that's they're gritty and i love that they do not let what others feelings or opinions form who how they feel about themselves or where they're going yeah so yeah they're, they're an amazing guest list so my daughter is a senior in high school my son's in eighth grade take us back a few more years what do you say to those that young generation who who ha may have that entrepreneurial blood and and but they just don't know what they want to do just try things out? What, what do you recommend? Try things out. Do not, and so specifically for your daughter that's a senior, do not think that you need to decide what you need to be professionally for your entire adult life in that one moment between senior year high school and, you know, junior year or freshman year of college. Like it just, it doesn't have to be decided then. It is way too big of a decision to leave up to that one moment when you have so little experience literally try different things out you know and if you go to school try out different courses try things that you might be interested in but haven't been on the radar that you've been a little bit you know reluctant to take just go try it out you never know what's going to give you that spark you know and when you're in eighth grade like literally just start start being comfortable being yourself literally try to do things to make yourself uncomfortable to break the the powers of peer pressure and just just step out and try to build your your, your comfort zone as big as possible. So when you're, when you're in high school and when you are a senior and when you're transcending to that next level, you're gonna be more ready to explore the world and take the world on and kind of 
live in the world. And that's, that's kind of the advice that I would give to, to people in that age range. Oh, that's great. That's great. So if you can, Dan, walk us through, what do you do on a daily basis? What's a daily routine? How early do you get up? Are you, are you getting into mindset? Do you do any meditation? What are some of your practices that you could prepare for yeah. your days? Yeah, so uh, I'm a Miracle Morning guy. I love it. I, I will say Sharif, my co-host on The Fact Show, just, just called our close-knit group of guys out and said, hey, we're gonna go through the Miracle Morning and start practicing this. But I'll tell you, so my very typical day, every day is different uh, based on our lifestyle we have, but my typical morning, I generally get up between five and six. I don't set an alarm clock. I wake up when I'm done sleeping. It's usually between then, and then I work out six days a week. And Monday through Saturday, I work out. Sunday's my total day off, you know, as I don't work out, I eat whatever I want, I don't care about it. But every other day, you know, I I work out first thing in the morning. I would like to say I take some quiet time, but generally by the time I'm done exercising, my kids are up. They're usually out trying to work out with me if I'm I'm working out at home or whatnot. Uh, But then I, I take time to play with my kids. You know, whether it be building Legos or playing some of the games that we have. You know, my kids right now are seven, five, and three. Um, and that's time that I'll never get back. So I, I try to, to really spend some time with them in the morning. And then most days, usually probably between eight and nine, is, is when I would start my professional day and work through it. Depending on the day, I might be engaged with one of my kids' activities or whatnot before I get back to work in the afternoon. And I try to, try to wrap things up between five and six to spend time with the family at night. And... Yeah, that's a very typical day, but... And then you start all over again. I do, but, but no, no two days are really the same. I mean, we, I live an amazing life with an amazing wife and kids, and with the, the challenges and opportunities that Employment Solutions presents and my role there versus the challenges and opportunities that Spin Geek presents and my role there, every day is a little bit different. But I think the important thing is, is I have a pretty clear picture of what I want my personal life to be, my wife and I, we, we know exactly what we want, where we're going, and what we want to get out of it. And we know the roles that, that Spin Gig and Employment Solutions play into that financially. So we know the sacrifices or the trade-offs that we're willing to make personally yes. to do those things. So uh, no two days are the same. But that's a, I do, I start. I'm very, very disciplined in the morning. I feel like if you win the morning, you set the tone for the day. And uh, I believe that. If you were to take out your cell phone and call the 20-year-old Dan, what would you say to him? Oof. You were probably in the army at that point, right? I was, yeah. 20-year-old Dan. You know, I'd like to sit back and say, hey, don't do this or, or do that. But the reality is, is I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything that I've done or not done maybe because I'm pretty happy where I arrived. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a holistic you know, embodiment of all the things that I've done. But the advice that I would give would be the same advice or the same message that I'm saying now is don't wait to be authentic. You know, you, you're a special guy, you have special talents, you, you have greatness within you, don't wait 20 years to unleash it, you know, and um, I think that's really all I would say. And I would hope that the 20 year old me would, would listen and, and maybe start building a platform of influence that can help more people than, than I've been able to so far. Wow. Well, look, you have given a, an hour worth, hours worth of gold and uh, many, many tips and ideas. And really, you know, you got me thinking. That's why I love these conversations, because not only do I learn from every single guest, but our audience learns and we're sharing. That's what it's all about this is great. in this day and age. So I, I'm, I'm so grateful that we were able to, to pull this off and do this today. Um, But one last question before I let you go. Oh, this is a trap question. I love it. Yes, it is. I ask every guest, at the end of the day, what do you want your legacy to be? So I live my life with a very direct mission statement that I look to positively impact the lives of those around me. And that's, that's truly how I go through life. I try to have some level of enrichment or positive impact to everybody that I come in in contact with. And so based on that, when someone was to ask me what I want my legacy to be in life, I will tell you that the first thing that I want to be known as is a great father and husband. Uh, I think that if at the end of my time, if people can look back at my life and say that guy 
with an incredible father and husband, then I would be satisfied with that. Beyond that, if, if I can have a legacy that I know that I put something in motion that is greatness and helping others perpetuate forward, I think that would be, that would be fantastic. So the other stuff, I don't need to be listed as a great business guy or a huge success. That is, it's important to some, but my, my family and the impact that I can have on the people around me is, is far more important to me. So I think that's the legacy that I would like to leave. Fantastic. Dan Morey, welcome to the American Real family. Thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate I can't wait to watch your career prosper because I know you still have lots of work to do. Write yeah. that book. We need to see that book from you. People are counting on it, and I, and, and I can't wait to listen to your podcast. Buddy, I appreciate that. I appreciate you pushing me to have this done today. This was great, and I'm excited. I'm excited for what you're doing, and I'll tell you, keep, keep doing this right here because the, the guests get a lot out of it. I can tell you that I've gotten a lot out of this, and I'm sure that the audience is going to take stuff from your guests, and they're going to become better because of you. So keep it up, man. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.